Hi, welcome to Transborder Art Conversations with Artists. I'm Graciela Castle, one of the directors of Transborder Art, and I'm very pleased to announce our 31st episode, Sculpting in Time. We are doing with a Zoom connection, and uh, I want to present you to our guest artists, Elisa Gutierrez Eriksen, Kathy Halfin, Jasmine Morel, and Victoria Catherine Chan. They have many interesting things to share, and stay tuned and enjoy it. I started working at the at the gallery Cien Metros Cubicos. Uh, that's that, that was my first curatorial experience. Um, we were doing exhibitions with emergent artists mostly, and um, and the, the thing that was interesting there is that besides representing these, these artists and doing exhibitions, we were accompanying them in the development of their work and, uh, in, and the, you know, like putting it out there basically, but we would help them with open calls and things like that. So it, that was the first time that I started working closely with artists. It was at, at a time where I was like basically trying to make my own work as an artist, which at the end, as you can imagine, it kind of like deflected into the curatorial practice. Um, I collaborated with many institutions in Mexico, the Centro Cultural España, Cultural Center of Spain, um, the Animasivo Festival, and the last thing that I did over there was uh, collaborate with the UNESCO field office, um, where I um, was a culture specialist uh, developing programs related to migration, um, sustainability, uh, ecology, education, etc. Um, and I think that in New York, my career as a curator has shifted a lot. Uh, I feel like before this, it was very informed by the institution that I was working with. Um, and now it's like more focused on the things that I'm like more interested personally. Of course, even if it's, you know, like still taking some of the things from that time. Um, and I want to share with you a couple of projects that I've been working on. Both were supposed to be open in the previous months. Of course, they didn't. So now <laughs> everything is pushed. Uh, one of them is um, uh, Subversive Kin. Is, this is an exhibition that hopefully will be presented in September in the um, um, Clemente Cultural Center in the Lower East Side. And in these exhibitions, I uh, bring together the work of uh, Christine Howard Sandoval, uh, Bet Faleiros, Tatiana Rocha, and Karen Miranda Rivadeneira. So all of them uh, work um, focusing on indigenous knowledge, on ancestry, on things related to migration. Oh, we have images. That's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> Um, so that, I'm gonna, just going to go back really quickly. That was the, the work that I did at the gallery, uh, working with the artist. So in this piece, Christine is going back to, um, uh, to, to New Mexico, to the place where uh, her mother grew up. And she developed this piece called Channel that talks about heritage and, um, and, and creates kind of like a, um, a reconstruction of the path of what a channel can be. It being like a channel itself, a channel of energy, a channel, a channel that can be like a ghostly um, presence kind of thing. So uh, she's revisiting this thing. She's creating video uh, related to this. Um, and, um, and then another one of the pieces in this exhibition from Belfalet, The Eye of Earth, where she uses local soil to honor um, the city uh, where um, her city in Brazil was founded. So she is basically uh, bringing back that attention to a forgotten history um, and to the many layers of like amnesia of that particular site. Um, what we're seeing right now is um, Magdalena Lukiewicz. Um, this is an exhibition that I curated a couple of months ago. That was the last exhibition, not the last, but one of the last exhibitions that I presented this year where she basically used um, materials uh, like glycerin, blood also, um, to kind of like stitch together her idea of a dream home. Um, so she created this installation in Stanford Gallery. So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna continue with common frequencies. So I was talking about Lorena Mal. Her work is based on the heartbeat of 88 different animal species. Um, 
she is recreating a sound like a, a, um, a sound score, putting together all these sounds and creating also uh, a series of patterns that kind of delve into music scores, into um, a live performance, and to um, intervened pieces also. She's gonna have a, like metronomes, kind of like, like marking the time of each different species. Um, she's like um, positioning five different stages of, um, of time for those animals, let's say. Um, and I guess that um, what interests me most about this piece and about the general subject of time related to all these pieces that I sort of very briefly talked about is to think about time. It's only to think about one portion of all the different vectors of time that exist in the world. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting thing for me, probably seeing one of the images from Jamila McKee when she uh, basically creates, she makes a performance, a, dur a durational performance uh, for the whole um, cycle of the moon, which um, we were just talking about it before starting, which is funny. Uh, but so throughout 27 days, she used different tools to just like dug dirt from the ground and create uh, a massive um, crater. Uh, so in this uh, piece, she's basically um, questioning like the impact of that humans can have on the earth and also thinking about this as a, as a you know, like reframing catastrophe as a slow action. Um, uh, so I think that it's also interesting how in that sense, time has a very, um, you know, like poignant um, presence in different works of art. Um, and probably that's already four minutes, so. Thank you so much, Elisa. My name is Jasmine Murrow. I'm an interdisciplinary artist um, working in different mediums from a range from installation to painting to sculpture to photography um, to um, activating um, sculptures to be wearable. Um, the first piece I guess I'm going to talk about is the um, immortal uterus. Um, this was an installation, a large scale installation that was inspired by the massive laboratory production of the first immortal cell. Um, the mortal cells that were like stolen from this African-American woman named Henrietta Lacks um, because she had um, cancer, um, cancer cells in her cervix that basically multiplied and um, at, during a time when the country was um, trying to create um, a cure for polio. So her cells have been used in this multi-million dollar industry to support like the first vaccinations for polio and countless other, other medical breakthroughs. Um, so the sculptures are these kind of installations where there's like this nameless like black void, but it also has like different sounds and depending on where it's been installed, uh, from different institutions or spaces or places around the world, it changes form, kind of like the same way cancer. I was really curious about the idea of something that could cure you or kill you, like these kind of um, extreme boundaries. So um, the material itself is like, it's made out of VHS film, who also has this kind of um, power of like, could be of propaganda, power of creating new narratives, or it could also, um, you know, completely um, expand the narrative. Um, and so um, that's one of the pieces. And um, the other pieces are, um, are some examples of my tapestries and paintings that are kind of a co combination of painting, printmaking, photography, and um, textile weavings. Um, I don't really think about categories when I'm making my work. I just kind of have ideas. Um, and so, you know, this particular tapestry 
um, that's made out of what like the gold teeth. I was really curious about memory and kind of collective memory and memory um, and how memory is kind of passed on and also how like trauma is kind of passed on and the possibility of being able to communicate between, you know, different time periods through memory. Um, and so one of the things that are kind of ancient that is also repeated is gold teeth. And so in this particular tapestry, you'll see, um, you know, images of like gold teeth. And then in combination with um, some, uh, you know, my grandmother's hand. So um, I guess many, this particular piece, I was really thinking about and curious about like what my ancestors think um, of today, like if they were alive today to see, you know, the, the process of humanity and the evolution of human beings and like, and that the piece was kind of like my response. Uh, hello, everybody. It's, uh, I'm really honored and excited to be part of this conversation today. I work on different um, kinds of uh, disciplines, including uh, uh, films, performances, live performances. And uh, here uh, I'm showing the project that uh, is a film performance uh, for the camera that I made uh, this December in Israel. Uh, in the film, um, my family and I are going together to the desert Arava in Israel and uh, we reflect on our experience of immigration. Um, that took place, the, exp the experience itself took place in 1997 after my family and I uh, immigrated because after the arrest of my father and after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, in the film, we come together to look at the past and reflect uh, on the time that passed, on relatives that we left in Ukraine, uh, on experience of adaptation and place uh, in experiences that we've been through. In the work, the desert itself becomes like a metaphor uh, of our migratory experience. This, the vastness of it, the silence, um, um, the vegetation suggests another time, the slower time in a desert that we experience. It envelops us uh, with our hopes, with our anxieties, uh, with our experience. And here my mom reads the letter that my father wrote me when he was uh, in Israel and we still been in, um, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, in another part of the film uh, that is called Planting the Teas, my father and I uh, are going to the desert together near the town that is called Elat uh, in Israel, the southern part. We go together uh, and as a ritual, we plant the teas, uh, the giant teas that I uh, created for the ritual. Uh, for me, this is a very important symbol. It is uh, a symbol of uh, adaptation, of survival, teas as, uh, as, a, as, as a live bone and with root. It's something that is uh, very understandable for us as immigrants uh, to adapt to the soil, to adapt to the new environment. My father and I, uh, we uh, create the hole in, in the soil and we um, plant the teas, literally insert the teas in the soil in desert Arava. And uh, uh, that's, that's an important ritual that um, uh, my father and I uh, created together as a family, as something that we bond and belong together to this place now. Uh, in the other part uh, of, the, uh, of the film, my father also gives an interview and explains a little bit about his experience in Soviet Union as well. Uh, and talks about that more. Um, my, my, my other work called Labor of Love, and Labor of Love uh, has uh, something to do with uh, the film that I created, the new work. Uh, Labor of Love uh, involves a, a very laborious uh, interaction with clay. 
uh, it's it's actually uh, bringing the experience inside from inside out uh, clay has a very um, very st strong experiential uh, quality like gravity for example so i apply clay on my body on my face and uh, i expose the experiences that i've been through as an immigrant uh, the stereotyping the experience uh, of my struggles and memories that i carry inside uh, another work uh, that um, i'm showing here called flossing time uh, in this work, I performed the grieving ritual uh, of uh, my grandmother that passed away uh, two years ago. Uh, in this ritual, uh, I go and I eat the grievel meal called uh, Ukrainian uh, meal kutya, and I share it with my grandma. I also uh, plant the teas in the soil as, uh, as as a ritual of saying goodbye to her, of something uh, like taking a part of our body and inserting it uh, to the soil and letting it go. That's basically it. Thank you, Katy. Thank you so much. So, Victoria, um, I could show it. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. I could explain. Um, I made a film several years ago in Italy in the industrial zone where I was looking for um, a, an old factory that actually was built during the, uh, the period of the Italian fascist um, after the first world war. And I was mostly interested in the relationship between the human and the place and the history and trying to gather all the collective memories uh, of a time. And for me, it's something very personal because it's, uh, and most interested in gathering a collective memory uh, of a time of a humanity um, that is for me something very timeless and that it's 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 also at the same time personal um, because this is something that i i have known since a child growing up in a working class um, environment because my father was also a factory worker. And it's, it's something that I see that the landscape today that is constantly changing, uh, especially a lot of like urban realities that are transforming quickly to post-industrial post era. I actually created a, uh, a wall that represents the actual detention building center. And I, collaborative with my father since i do not know how to um write chinese calligraphy unfortunately um for the fact that i was uh, born and raised in uh, in montreal in canada so i asked my dad to actually um write the poetry um out of a a selection out of a book that I, I got from while visiting the actual um, Angel Island Immigration Detention Center, which today um, is a historical museum. So just to give you the information, the actual Angel Island Detention Center um, is sort of like the Ellis Island in New York, but um, it has um, harder, like harsher, um, strict, um, rules for for the admission of um, of of newcomers, especially those who comes from Asia, more specifically from China. And I decided to use a performance and also to make a installation work out of this. And I learned to carve, so I followed the actual strokes um, in which my father wrote on the piece of wall in a way it's to recreate a place and um my own imaginary of a location that where my ancestor has been through and has experienced so i wanted to relive this experience by using a form of gesture and using repetition and exploring this idea of what is lost and how I could, in a way, reclaim this part of the history of my family. 
it's the idea of the abstraction of the wall through the light beams that each light represents a voice. It's an invisible uh, voice that is being commemorated uh, once you touch something. So it's also the idea of, ex of touching something that you cannot touch. Thank you. Very and, beautiful. Very yeah. beautiful, Victoria. Is, uh, you, you always speak about the, the process of things and you let us know all the process that is invisible. We are back again to open the mic to our audience. I believe they're very interested in making comments. Yeah, I was reminded um, of a Greek mythology by the teeth that uh, Kati puts into the soil. It's very, it's a very old trope. So there I see a connection that I can understand. Interesting. Can you talk a little bit more? What, uh, what kind of trope is that? I want to know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, so there's a Greek myth uh, of a group of people, uh, they're Argonauts, and they have to um, have many adventures. And uh, one of them is Jason, uh, Jason. And uh, one of his uh, miracles is that I think he, um, he has dragon teeth in a, in a pouch and he throws them on the floor and a lot of undead soldiers uh, are rising up. You see this a lot of fantasy movies, fantasy video games, something like that. Uh, wow. So you, you can find that. Surely. That's interesting. I read Agronauts, but I, I, I completely, it's, it's not connected. That's so wonderful that you are making this connection. I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. So people will remember when you have teeth in the ground, and especially the large ones, you know, with your father, the big ones, they, look, they could be dragon teeth. Why not? You know, so um, okay. I, there's a layer of meanings that you didn't even know exist, but. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Something to Jasmine. Sure. You were saying that the piece that you have behind you is a sound piece. Can you t tell us more about that? Um, sure. It's, um, it's only part of it. It's called Some Impossibility um, Without a Name. And um, I guess in particular, I took all of these. I'm originally from Detroit. And um, a lot of my work deals with kind of myth making in media and um the other installation was out of film and just how this whole idea of myths that are kind of created from like commercial music and and films and how those ideologies affect us so i was really wanted to um do something about because everyone thinks of detroit as like of just motown but actually it had like the largest um, publishing of like jazz and it was just so many different genres of techno, um, it just experimental music that came out of. So I basically destroyed them and I had like a really, maybe about a thousand different um, albums that were created in Detroit and um, and then after they were destroyed, I recorded the sound of them. And so, yeah, so that was kind of like how it was initially was supposed to be played. So when you come closer to the work, it's, um, yeah, it comes out of, I, I was really inspired by like um, fungus, you know, and like the idea of something that could be out of, um, just dead matter and things like that. So it was like a modern day, like, um, you know, like living fungus in a way. So it keeps kind of growing and stuff. And, you know, as I find more records. Uh, something to say. I was, I was really fascinated about like the connection between uh, four of us. I actually, it, it's really interesting how each individual artist is thinking about uh, the soil and the site and the and the time in their in their different ways. And I think it's also very relevant today because we are all thinking about uh, the climate change and like the referencing that as well. And we are doing it maybe like in our personal ways, but it's always it's always on the back of our mind. I think it's always connected. We, we know what's going on. And I was really curious and um, amazed to hear about all the recordings of the minerals and the species that Elisa was talking about. I'm really thinking about them also as like alive beings as well. 
something that we just don't know and, and if we allow ourselves we maybe discover uh, wow. yeah i definitely think of them as live beings you know like as i was saying it's just we have different temporalities that's all you know like i was reading the other day someone that was saying that rocks are the oldest species you know like or, or the ones not the oldest but the ones that live the most um mm -hmm. So, you know, like there's a lot that we don't know because it happens, you know, in a very different um, um, timeline, you know, it's, it's just like you, you, when, you, when you see like plants, there was, uh, there's been a video in Facebook that people have been posting and reposting of someone that made a time lapse of their plants and it's just the plants. that we think that don't have life are alive you know it's just a different thing like we are all species different species in this planet and we're just like too eager to think that we are the most important one you know i was i was reading um the, uh, the this like amazing book of uh it's uh the a brief history of physics um carlo rovelli is the author and it's just like a teeny tiny book that kind of like goes through the seven like major um, uh, theories of physics. And then at the end, it makes a conclusion that I thought it was like really heartbreaking, but real. And he was like, well, at the end of the day, I think that this world was created without humans and it's gonna end without humans, you know? Mm -hmm and all the other things are gonna continue. And if the other, you know, like homo sapiens species didn't survive, why should we, you know? It's just kind of a timeline. And we're just like pressing to that timeline and to reach to that point. And, and we have no idea and we think that we're eternal, but we're not. So I do think that all those things are living and it's just kind of like live in a different space and, and, and in a different vector of time.